it's over. The Nerd Byword Podcast has the high ground. In today's episode, we are fixing Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. And welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Byword Podcast. And let me tell you, today we have a exciting episode. We are going to wrap up our look at the prequel trilogy of Star Wars and try to fix Revenge of the Sith. But before we do, we have to hit up the nerd news. Chris, what do you have for us this week? I have a new uh, Star Wars animated series. Um, we have a Bad Batch uh, series that's been announced. Um, and I'm reading this directly from StarWars.com. Uh, Dave Filoni, uh, as is the case with the Clone Wars animated series and Star Wars Rebels, um, he's going to be the, the real creative mind behind this series, it looks like. Um, a lot of, a lot of the people who worked on, on other Star Wars shows are going to be returning. Um, Star Wars The Bad Batch, and I'm reading this directly from StarWars.com's press release. Star Wars The Bad Batch is executive produced by Dave Filoni, The Mandalorian, Star Wars The Clone Wars, Athena Portillo, uh, Star Wars The Clone Wars, and Star Wars Rebels, Brad Rao, who was on Rebels in Resistance, Jennifer Corbett, who was on Resistance and NCIS, with Carrie Beck, a Mandalorian in Rebels, as co-executive producer, and Josh Rimes as producer from Star Wars Resistance. Rao is also serving as supervising director with Corbett as head writer. Um, I'm going to be honest here with my initial reaction. Um, admittedly, this was, I felt, the weakest arc of Season 7 of The Clone Wars, The Bad Batch. It was like a four, I want to say it was a four-episode arc to begin um, Season 7. Now, with all that being said, I really feel like I felt that way because I was ready for all of the things that had been promoted leading up to the final season of Clone Wars. I was ready to see the duel between Ahsoka Tano, my goddess, and Darth Maul. I was ready to see the Siege of Mandalore um, play out. I was ready to see um, their take on Order 66 and Anakin's turn. So hopefully this should give them the appropriate attention and their origin story that, that they deserve and that they need. And it's not thrown into someone else's story. Um, and as I've said before on this podcast, in Filoni we trust. Um, it looks like everything that I've read online that John Favreau and Dave Filoni are going to be kind of like that Kevin Feige type role going forward in Star Wars. And I can't think of two individuals that I would rather have you know, being responsible for Star Wars content going forward. The Mandalorian is perfection for me. Um, it's exactly what I always wanted out of Star Wars. It takes um, a character, uh, someone, a character that is similar to Boba Fett. Boba Fett being a character that I really just, oh man, was was I super fanboyed out over for so many years, and it gave us even a deeper um, story behind Mandalorian culture and. You know, gave us iconic quotes like "This is the way" and "I have spoken," and gave us Baby Yoda. Like, how, you can't ask for much more out of a series. And when you have the two minds behind that being in charge going forward, I feel great about the direction that Star Wars is headed in. So, um, admittedly, again, I was kind of so-so on the Bad Batch's introduction, but hopefully, this gives them the attention that they need and deserve. What do you think, Dave? I, I kind of react exactly the way you did. Um, I didn't think they were a particularly strong part of the uh, Clone Wars cartoon. I, I'm cautiously intrigued, I guess. This is not the show I was expecting or even really would have asked for. Um, and the, the clones in particular, uh, the clone troopers and all that, from a story perspective, have never been that interesting to me. So the people that are involved are clearly a sign of quality, so I'm hopeful it's going to be a good show. Uh, but it is not 
it is not the show I would have asked for as a fan. I would have much rather seen an Ahsoka Tano show, to be honest. Uh, she stands as one of the best characters of Star Wars. Uh, and although I'm looking forward to her live-action debut uh, in The Mandalorian Season 2, the way it's looking right now, I think she could carry her own show very well. So, um, if given a choice, I probably would have gone in a different direction. But, ultimately, um, there's quality people involved, and I don't doubt that it'll be a quality show. Yeah, I absolutely feel that way as well. And just on a side note, when I, I saw this news post, I text, I screenshotted it and sent it to you. And I think we both misread it as the bad expletive. And you said, that's how I read it. And I was like, you know, the bad you know what, that would be a great uh, Ahsoka Tano title. So um, <laughs> um, it's, it's no secret that I am number one uh, president CEO of the Ahsoka Tano fan club. So uh, I'm right there with you. I would love her story. Her novel is fantastic. Her adventures um, and her story following Order 66 is so great. Um, the audiobook is fantastic with Ashley Eckstein actually reading it, the voice actor behind the character. Um, Rosario Dawson is an incredible actor. I'm a big fan of her work. Um, so I'm excited to see how that plays out. But um, it's more Star Wars. And like you said, with the people behind it, I, I trust in them. Uh, Dave, what do you have for us news-wise this week? Yeah, I wanted to take a moment to talk about the DC Universe television show Stargirl, which has recently been uh, renewed for season two. Uh, Variety reports that the television series Stargirl has been renewed for a second season. Uh, the show stars Breck Bessinger as Courtney Whittemore, a teenager who becomes uh, the heir of the superhero Starman. Uh, the character was created by Jeff Johns, who uh, was inspired by his sister, who tragically passed away several years ago. Uh, so this renewal does not come without some changes, and that has uh, the fan base a little bit concerned. Uh, the show has been streaming on DC Universe, and then airing on the CW the following day. For season two, the CW will become the exclusive home of Stargirl. Uh, Fans have been quick to point out that much of DC Universe's television output has been finding new homes. Uh, for example, Doom Patrol has recently moved to HBO Max. And there is some concern that this particular streaming service might be going away. More concerning for Stargirl, though, is that the quality of the writing and special effects has been quite high on DC Universe. They've put a good amount of money behind this television show. And a lot of fans fear that the move to the CW will come with budget cuts and maybe cast changes that will adversely affect the final product. Now, I've really been enjoying Stargirl so far. The show has a vibe like really no other superhero show on television right now. There's almost a, a retro 1950s cool about it, even though it takes place in contemporary America. The effects and acting have been great. The writing is sharp. You know, the best way to describe the tone of this show is almost like a Back to the Future kind of vibe. So it, it's a very good show. Now, when Supergirl famously moved... Uh, from uh, CBS after its first season to the CW, the show went through some really big changes, including budget, cast, and even filming location. So the show returned as a different beast from season one in a lot of ways. My hope here is that Stargirl can avoid this problem. Uh, right now, it probably stands as one of my favorite DC-based superhero shows. Chris, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, this was really interesting for me to see um, I'm not familiar with the character or the series at all, so I, I'm completely at a casual approach here. But um, as you kind of kind of hinted at, it seems like the writing is on the wall with DC Universe. I'm really confused by the direction that Warner Brothers and DC, um, you know, films and series are going um, with HBO Max emerging. Um, I, I don't. I just don't know what what DC Universe. I I, um, I, I asked you the other day. Do you think it's something? Um, that you think would be worth investing in. I'm looking at it more from um, like a reader's perspective. I was interested in, you know, uh, reading comics on there. But, um, you know, I don't know how long that's going to last. And everything just seems kind of muddled, especially from my casual, um, mostly Marvel uh, point of view. Yeah, so ultimately, uh, DC Universe does have some other stuff going for it, including comics and the like. Um, but... I think the big pitch was uh, the television output, a lot of original shows, uh, Titans, 
uh, which has not found a new home for season three yet. They have not announced anything differently there. Doom Patrol Swamp Thing surprisingly only lasted one season despite good critical buzz. That was sort of the main pitch uh, of this service. And so everything seems to slowly be moving away from that. And I think HBO Max is gobbling up a lot of that stuff. Uh, it it kind of stands... Uh, we're just going to have to wait and see, I think, uh, what's going to happen ultimately with DC Universe. But the, the the things that they've been creating for DC Universe have been high quality, and I would absolutely hate to lose some of those. All right, that is our nerd news segment for this week. After a quick break, we will be back with our attempt to fix Revenge of the Sith. And we're back. Ladies and gentle people, this is the climax, the grand finale of our attempt to fix the Star Wars prequel trilogy. We have gone through the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones in previous weeks, and now we are left with the finale, Revenge of the Sith. As always, we have each selected three big fixes that we believe these movies need, as well as several smaller fixes which we'll get to in our lightning round. This time, Chris will start us off. Chris, what is the first big fix that you think Revenge of the Sith needs to be a better movie? Um, for me, and I hinted at this, I believe, in the Phantom Menace episode, um, it's the problematic Palpatine. Um, Emperor Palpatine, Darth Sidious, Sheev, comes across as a mustache-twirling, cartoony villain here. And the fact that no one can figure out his plots, it is just laughable. Um, the, the obvious, obvious ploys that he is the architect of all of these schemes are right there in front of your face. I'm not a Jedi, but I can tell that he's the villain. Um, and I came up with three strategies here. Three possible strategies because we want to fix this. I'm trying to be optimistic in my language. I don't want to just crap on it. We've been doing that for how many years with these prequels. I want to fix it. So I have three ideas how to fix the problematic Palpatine. Number one, make it like he's a mob boss behind the scenes. You know, he's, um, you know, the money behind it. He's kind of like um, a lobbyist, if you will. And like, like we have in DC politics in America. Um, that he's the real power in Washington. Um, and he's the one behind the scenes shifting. You know, if you still want to involve the Senate, that's fine. But he's the real voice. He's not the chancellor. He's the one that is manipulating everything. That's fine. So do that behind the scenes. Don't make it so freaking obvious. Number two is a really simple one. When he is assuming the persona of Darth Sidious, rather than just bringing the cloak down over his eyes and altering his voice ever so slightly, put on a mask. Some kind of get up to where you remove a mask. You know, they've done it in comics for how many years? You had that with the Green Goblin. You had that with the Hobgoblin. You know, how many characters, how many arch nemeses, how many supervillains had a mask? And unmasking is a real big thing. So just do that. Putting on a mask does something at least. Um, and then my very minimalistic approach, don't change anything, no big changes. At the very least, this is my third strategy, at the very least, stop with the obvious stuff. The whole scene where um, he's about to kill Count Dooku in this film, and he just says, do it, do it. Like, how can, how can Anakin sit there and be like, okay, slice his head off, and not think that that's a little bit weird that the Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Senate just advocated murder. Is that not strike you as odd, Annie? Come on. Um, and then, like, the whole, every time that he meets with Anakin, the way that he is deriding this passive-aggressive um, commentary towards the Jedi Council. Oh, they should have chosen you, Anakin. I'm just so disappointed that they didn't select you for this mission. Like... It's pretty heavy-handed. And then I think the worst one of all is at the end of The Phantom Menace, when Yoda is talking to, I think it was Mace Windu or Obi-Wan, one of them, at the uh, funeral for 
Qui-Gon Jinn. And Yoda says something to the effect of, we have to figure out who's the master and the apprentice. I'm not going to do a Yoda impression. I'm not good at it. Um, I wonder who's the master or who's the apprentice or whatever. And then the camera directly goes like so close to Palpatine's face. You can see his nose hairs. Come on. So yeah, pick one of those three strategies, but please stop trying to think that I could fall for this. What do you think, Dave? I totally agree with you. I always uh, thought really that his do it uh, scene was uh, originally intended to be a, some kind of cross promotion with Mountain Dew or something. <laughs> uh, that 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 was that was sort of my initial impression of how he delivered that line. Look, uh, Ian McDermott's uh, acting is really great in this movie because it's compulsively watchable. Um, except for a couple of scenes when he's disfigured and then when he fights Yoda. In those scenes, the hand is strong with him. But other than that, uh, as just as an actor, uh, he's fascinating to watch. He's like so many other actors in this uh, trilogy in that George Lucas doesn't give him a whole lot to work with as far as, you know, motivation, uh, some some deeper stuff that you can really dig into. Uh, at the end of the day, he's been sort of the overarching villain for three movies, and we really know nothing about his motivation. Like, his mustache-twirling villain sums it up really well. You know, I also absolutely hated the whole lightning disfiguring his face thing. I, I don't know why... I don't know why he could have not just looked like that in Return of the Jedi because of his age and the cost that the dark side of the Force has on your body, rather than like, oops, I shot myself in the face with lightning and melted my forehead. Uh, it's it's a little odd. Uh, yeah, but ultimately... Not to mention it's bad CGI. Not to mention, like, the whole effect, it's so bad. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's very telegraphed, and I, it would have been more fun uh, if it would have not been so obvious. And I think I mentioned this briefly when we were talking about uh, episode one, it would have been very nice if we would have never seen Darth Sidious until this movie. You'd, he's always mentioned, he's whispered about. You have Palpatine right there. But as a Star Wars fan, I know that Palpatine ends up as the Emperor, and then you throw in this Darth Sidious character, and I would have been the whole time like, uh, who's Darth Sidious, and why have we not seen this guy? And then to have a revelation that, oh, Palpatine is Darth Sidious, would have been a really cool little twist. It would have been a lot less obvious than what they ended up going with. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, um, I like my mysteries. You know, forgive me if I'm wrong here, but I like my mysteries to have a little mystery. Um... But yeah, uh, I listen to another podcast called The Rewatchables, and they go through and give awards for each, you know, category or whatever. And one of them is for overacting. And, like, Ian McDermott should be in the overacting hall of fame for these films. Like, taking a little bit of material and just going to another stratosphere, another galaxy, if you will, with this. But, um... Uh, uh, he is a talented actor, um, but but like we said, I think it was in the previous pod, um, if you're given crappy ingredients, if you're given a crappy script, which we'll, I think we'll get into in just a moment, um, then there's only so much you can do, and you're relying on improvisation and, you know, the acting choices of, of your cast and crew. Um, Dave, what is first up on your big three fixes for this film? For me, it's just that we have to fix Anakin's motivation and his turn to the dark side. It's really supposed to be the core of this movie, but it's not working. Why does Anakin ultimately turn to the dark side? Even after watching this movie, I don't think I can give a definite answer. The movie isn't clear. On the one hand, the movie sets forth the notion that this is all about fear, his fear of losing people he loves, Padme in particular. On the other hand, there's also this strained relationship with the Jedi that they're building up. He wants to be a master, but he doesn't get the promotion he wants. Uh, even near the end of the movie, when he's full on dark side, he suddenly talks about wanting to rule the galaxy. Where, where, where did that come from? It, boundless ambition does not equal fear of losing Padme. So I think there's like two different motivations at work here, and it's like George Lucas couldn't quite figure out which one he wants to go with. He really needed to commit. This inconsistency makes it hard to root for Anakin at any point. Ambition is an interesting reason to fall to the dark side. Fear of loss is an interesting reason. But you gotta pick one, otherwise it's not clear what Anakin's ultimate motivation is for turning to the dark side. 
The movie should really stick with his fear of loss and, and add to it. Let's have the Jedi find out about his marriage, for example, and try to separate him from Padme and his uh, soon-to-be-born kids. That gives him a much more believable reason to sour on the Jedi than they won't grant me the rank of master. It's not fair. It's outrageous, even. Like, this is not quite the right motivation we're looking for. And so when he finally does turn in that scene with Palpatine and Mace Windu, it is such a, almost like a, a switch is being flipped. So if we focus on one particular piece of motivation, we amplify it a little bit, then when we get to that point where he has to make a choice and he ultimately turns, it will be more believable. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I absolutely agree. It seems like um, this sounds like one of those solo superhero movies when they throw way too many villains. Um, I'm getting echoes of Spider-Man 3 when you had like a decent enough villain and you uh, had a great backstory with Sandman and then they took Venom, one of the most popular villains in the, the Spider-Man mythos, and then you just threw him in there as like a side quest and you never really... Um, fully panned out either village and uh, villains origin story. Um, and then, you know, if you've got, you know, there's a saying in sports, if you've got two quarterbacks, then you have no quarterbacks. So, you know, if, if you've got, you know, two villains in a superhero film, you've got no real villains. And, in, and it works here as well. Neither one of them were fully fleshed out. And I totally agree with you. Pick one because either one fully fleshed out standing on their own works. But everything about this, I feel, is also rushed. Like that whole scene that you described between um, Palpatine and Mace Windu, and Anakin joins in, he goes from, what have I done, to, yes, my master, in literal seconds on screen. Yes, it's like a, a switch has been flipped. Exactly. I mean, what have I done, and he's in tears and he's crying, to quick wipe those tears away, I need you to go slaughter children, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, there's no thought towards the inc implications of these choices, his life with Padme, her reaction, what she thinks about it. And that's something I'll get into with one of my later points, but like, it is just so rushed. I mean, it's crazy that in a trilogy with three films, that this is a consistent thing we keep coming up with is that everything is rushed. You gave us three feature length films and we still feel like everything is rushed because it was not, you didn't pick something and go with it. Um, and I think like the best films that are based on, let's say, for example, a comic book, those should be based on like a single issue or maybe a small arc, like three issue arc with one primary villain or one primary story. When you, when you introduce multiple storylines that don't really pan out, don't really pay off, that are told to complete fruition, you have a muddled mess like we have here. Yeah, absolutely. And really, I think in a lot of ways, this wouldn't feel as rushed if he would have taken a, a bold risk of turning Anakin uh, in Attack of the Clones. Yeah, there's something to be said about Empire Strikes Back, the middle piece of the original trilogy being a dark movie that ends on a downer. And on the flip side here, we have uh, the middle piece, the middle movie, uh, ending on a wedding. And that's not really a dark place to end. And then the end of the trilogy ends in this incredibly dark place. Now, there, there is a function to that, obviously. I mean, things have to go bad uh, in order for there to have to be a new hope in Episode 4. But if, if you would have went ahead and turned Anakin in the previous movie towards the end, then you have time to explore him trying to lead this double life, really serving Palpatine, um, but also still being technically with the Jedi and working as, you know, maybe a spy for him. There's all this conflict and can, can he tell Padme what he's really becoming? And th there, there's more meat there to the movie then and it won't feel so rushed. So Chris, what is your next big point of what we need to do to fix Revenge of the Sith? For me, it's one of the most meme-worthy things and it's one of the most, I'm being honest, disgusting things from this film. Um, it's the slaughter of the younglings. It, it just doesn't add anything to this. I don't feel like... I don't feel any further convinced that he's gone to the dark side. I feel like it's just... 
it's just added for shock value that he would go to this extent, that he would murder children. Um, we talked about this in episode, uh, the Phantom Menace episode with episode one, um, that him killing Maul should have been this momentous occasion. Um, and you have like the rule of two with the Sith. If you would, and I'll get to this later, but if you would explain that, the rule of two, that Sith, then you would have understand you would have understood that why that that was momentous if you did, again flesh that story out but killing small children adds nothing um also this scene could have easily just been regular old jedi or even padawans um and it would have still i think had the same desired effect that he goes back to his old stomping grounds of the jedi temple and he's mowing down his old pals the fact that he's killing children, I think it's just disgusting, and it doesn't add anything to the story. I think it's a very poor choice from the top down, um, and I feel like it, it would. It, I think it would have been even more effective if he would have gone to like someone that he had relationships with and previous contact with. If he would have built something that, and then taken them out, not babies. That does nothing for me except for deeply anger me. What do you think? I, I totally agree with you. It's a deeply jarring scene. For one, it doesn't feel earned to begin with because, as we already previously mentioned, he flips to the dark side in about 2.2 seconds and it's just fully evil from one moment to the next. So th this, this doesn't feel believable and it doesn't feel earned. Uh, but in addition, even taking that off the board, I, you are exactly right. H him going after a group of children and slaughtering them adds absolutely nothing to the story. It's shock value, pure and simple. And yes, I agree with you again that he should have went after somebody who had been a friend or maybe a fellow Padawan or something, somebody that we've seen pop up here and there again, and then it would have had emotional heft without going to this incredibly weird, dark place of, okay, the guy we've been rooting for for two and a half movies is now killing a whole bunch of children. I, I it just, It's kind of an inconceivable place to go with this. I think it's one of the few scenes from this movie that really stand out and hold it back from being a resounding award as the best of the three. And that's, you know, not much of a bar to to clear but from it being the best of the three i think just in sheer remembrance you think oh yeah well revenge of the sis was, was okay and i think this scene in particular is one of the few scenes that really holds it back from it was a good movie it keeps me in the threshold of it was okay this movie was okay because it is such an unnecessary and just ridiculous scene that that is completely unnecessary but yeah, Dave, what's number two on your big three? It is the meaninglessness of Doku's death. So Doku was set up as an important character in episode two. And then here, like so many other villains before him, he's completely discarded in the opening moments in favor of yet another disposable villain, General Grievous, who doesn't even make it to the end of this movie. Lucas, I know, tries to mirror the battle between Anakin and Dooku with the battle between Vader and Luke and Return of the Jedi, with Palpatine sitting on this throne looking on. And visually, it is a good mirror, but thematically, it's not. Because, first of all, we don't even know what's going on between Palpatine and Dooku here. It's never explicitly stated, even, that Dooku is, is a Sith himself. Is he part of the Ruler 2? Is he Palpatine's apprentice? It's never spelled out. At no point is there this moment, like it was with, with Luke and Vader, where uh, Palpatine basically says, kill him and take his place. And that, that is the place where really this movie should have rhymed, where it should have reflected the previous movie, because of the idea of the Rule of Two among the Sith. Let's not even mention that Anakin hesitates for nearly a full minute, and Dooku is just kneeling there waiting. How about trying to talk your way out of this? Tell Anakin that he's being used. Confess that Palpatine is Sidious. Do something. Dooku literally is just kneeling there waiting for Anakin to decide whether he's going to decapitate him. It is such an odd moment. This moment should have come later in the movie. This moment should have been between Anakin and Darth Maul. 
and this moment should have been, Anakin, it's time for you to kill Maul and take your place as my new apprentice. This should have been the final test, the moment where Anakin turns. And instead, it is another wasted moment on a disposable villain who is literally disposed just to introduce another disposable villain. So you fix this by keeping Darth Maul around and making this battle the turning point. And then you have a wonderful parallel when you get to Return of the Jedi, where Luke is the one who will not go where his dad would have gone. His dad is the one who cut down the previous apprentice and became a Sith, and Luke is the one who rejects that notion. It would be a, a great thematic parallel. But as it stands, it's not. It's just another wasted moment. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and Christopher Lee's reaction in this scene as Dooku says it all, that look of shock on his face is like, I mean, that's exactly how I feel as an audience member and as a Star Wars fan. Like, just just, just do it. Just kill him. Like, it, it makes no sense. There's no meaning behind his death. And the fact that, once again, as you said, Anakin is just like, okay, slice him. Um, he doesn't think it's sketchy at all um, that, as I said before, the Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Senate is advocating not just murder, but beheading. So, um... And the fact that it does not occur to Anakin, that that's not the Jedi way. We've talked about the mischaracterization of the Jedi um, in this series before. And like some really sketchy stuff that, that, that I think both of us grew up on, you know, like the Jedi creed and the parallels to Buddhism. And, you know, the parallels to a samurai and the code of honor. And this violates all of that. And as you said, the rule of two, um, you know, could have been in play here. But that's not known unless you do a deep dive Google search or you go, you know, Star Wars Extended Universe. You wouldn't know that. The casual Star Wars fan knows nothing about the rule of two. In fact, I didn't know anything about it until I did exactly that a couple of years ago. And I went on a deep dive and like now it, you know, kind of makes sense. But uh, uh, once again, I've said this before, I have to do all the work myself as an obsessive fan to find any meaning. You should be able to tell a complete story and deliver that. I should not have to do that. Um, and for me, this once again just shows that there's no consistent plan or through line with this trilogy, um, which you know is, is really concerning considering the fact that they had two decades to plan this out. I understand um, when you look at the original trilogy and Luke and Leia make out in Empire Strikes Back. And that was because, according to multiple sources, um, no one knew that they were brother and sister yet. They hadn't planned that out. That's fine. I can excuse that. But when you have two decades to plan out this entire trilogy, um, and I feel like the same goes with the sequel trilogy, um, you know, the... Uh, Rise of Skywalker particularly shows that they didn't really have any through line or plan with this trilogy. Um, and I feel like that, that is indicative of this scene here where you have a, a villain and this is supposed to, to mean something, but it just falls flat once again, as so many things do uh, in these films. Yeah, that's exactly right. So Chris, what is your next point about how we can fix Revenge of the Sith? Anakin is still a whiny punk. Um, the first 20 minutes, I, I said this to you, I think, last night before I finish up the film. The first 20 minutes of this movie are pitch perfect. I love the dog fights. I love how they fly into that hangar, the whole thing with the buzz droids. And Anakin is, um, it's, he's so heroic. And it's in contrast to all of the issues that we had um, with Attack of the Clones. Um, he's the consummate jedi hero in this film he, he's still a rogue and he's a little bit towing the line pushing the envelope but he's still undoubtedly heroic in the first 20 minutes of this movie until you get to that dooku scene um and then after those first 20 minutes oh man when when obi-wan does that maneuver when he flies into the hangar and leaps immediately out of his cruiser it's just fantastic after that 20 minutes is up, though, Anakin 
reverts back to being a whiny punk. He just is constantly whining. He's always complaining. He's complaining about the Jedi Council and they won't give him the rank of Master. Um, he's whining about Obi-Wan. He's uh, like uncomfortably angry about Obi-Wan. Um, <clears throat> and this is someone you're supposed to have a close relationship, a brotherhood, if you will. Um, it's not believable because he spends the entirety of these two films nearly complaining about him. Um, so he really comes across as like a trust fund kid, like a privileged individual who just whines constantly the whole time. And that's a really weird thing to say about someone who was enslaved as a child, that they would come across that way. But it's just a really strange characterization, and I don't know what the source of that is. It may be the script, and maybe the acting choices. Um, my intuition leans on the script, um, but... You know, you can only do so much with what you're given. But yeah, Anakin's still a whiny punk. I don't know how you can have the central figure of this trilogy, the one that we're supposed to be believing in, the one we're supposed to be rooting for, the one we're supposed to be crushed at when he falls to the dark side. And it falls flat because he's a whiny punk the whole time. What do you think? Yeah, so I think that George Lucas may have actually done some character research for his writing by going to middle school and observing the absolute <laughs> worst behavior that you might find in a sort of pre-adolescent setting. Because that is exactly what Anakin acts like. Uh, when he doesn't get what he wants, it's outrageous and it's not fair. And yeah, I don't like my cinematic heroes to whine uh, like that. It, it does not uh, really connect me with the character. It doesn't make me like the character. I don't feel bad for him. Because, you know, people who try to get what they want by whining, ultimately, are not exactly heroic. And so, yeah, he comes across very poorly. And you are exactly right when you say in the first 20 minutes he comes closest to what we have been talking about through this entire trilogy, about how he should be uh, seen. You know, he's heroic, but he also goes a little bit off script. He's uh, definitely trying really hard. He's protective of uh, his friend, even uh, after the whole Dooku thing. I absolutely loved how he refused to let Obi-Wan just lay there. You know, his fate will be our fate. That's the one scene where I was like, okay, he's a hero. I bought it. Yeah, and finally it actually felt like, oh, there really is a connection with him and Obi-Wan. And then, you know, just a few scenes later, he's whining about Obi-Wan again. So yeah, it is it's just such a poor characterization of Anakin. And it also really, in a lot of ways, tarnishes Darth Vader for me. Because when he steps in onto, the, onto that ship at the beginning of A New Hope, I'm like, oh, there's that whiny brat again. Like, the whole mystique is suddenly gone out of Darth Vader because now I see this Anakin under the helmet. And it's just uh, it's just a weird contrast. Yeah, and like, you, I even think about, like, the final scene um, with Anakin, Vader, um, in Return of the Jedi, where they remove his mask and he's, you know, this doting father. Like, are, are we sure that's the same guy? Because... That's not the Anakin you showed me in the prequels. But yeah, uh, it's, it's just really such a regrettable thing. Um, and like, this was the most important thing. And it's one of the things, when when you announce a project like this, where you take something that is so highly regarded and so beloved by millions of people across the globe, like Star Wars is, when you take something like the original trilogy, and we're like, hey, we're going to tell the backstory of that we're gonna tell darth vader as a child you better do it perfectly um and you know any little thing is gonna be nitpicked you know you're dealing with nerds here we're gonna pick it apart but yeah so um when you in this case it, it just falls so flat for me dave what is your final point of your big three before we hit the lightning round yeah so uh this is very much in parallel to something I said when it came to Attack of the Clones, particularly the use of Yoda in the final lightsaber duel. I'm going to go ahead and echo this here and say that I believe that the Yoda-Palpatine battle should not have happened. I think that whole scene should just never have been in the movie. 
Um, I was pretty clear in our Attack of the Clones episode that I thought that Yoda with a lightsaber is kind of a violation of the character. Um, and I'll go a step further and I will say that I think it's also a violation of Palpatine's character for him to leap around with a, with a lightsaber. At no point really before or after this movie is there any indication that Palpatine ever used a lightsaber. In fact, in Return of the Jedi he refers to Luke's lightsaber as a Jedi weapon. Based on the original trilogy, I was always under the impression that Vader used a lightsaber because he used to be a Jedi. I didn't ever feel like every Sith runs around with a lightsaber. And so it's very strange then uh, when you have this Yoda-Palpatine battle and, and Yoda whips out his little lightsaber and starts jumping around and Palpatine whips out his lightsaber and starts jumping around and everybody's just jumping around like, I don't know, little jumping beans or something. And the problem to me with this is pretty clear. Neither character looks very good in this battle, and it betrays both of their core characters. Yoda is the wise old man who is above violence. Palpatine is the cowardly schemer. Neither one of these two characters should really be jumping around with a lightsaber. Worse, Yoda ends the battle by running away, which makes his character look especially poor. You know, at least he should have been injured or something, and then somebody had to come and rescue him and pull him out of there. Because it doesn't even seem like Yoda well went full force in this battle. Like, he, he gave it his all. He's like, oh, no, nope, this isn't working. I better run off to a planet and hide for the next 20 years. In the end, I, I think this battle was just a huge mistake, and it should have been avoided. Palpatine without a lightsaber versus Mace Window would have been a better situation and allowed for a definite end to the confrontation because now we have a confrontation in the movie between Yoda and Palpatine that never gets followed up again the two never meet again and so there's this definite sense that there's Palpatine the dark side that has definitely beaten what what is generally considered to be the greatest Jedi of this generation Yoda the dark side has won. There's never a rematch. There, there's never a resolution to this conflict. There's never a round two. It's just there to look cool, but it really adds nothing to the story. And in fact, I think it detracts from the story. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and your point about Mace Windu, I feel like that would be much more earned. And um, I almost made this a campaign part, Justice for Mace Windu. Like His character in these films is so underserved. Um, and the only memorable scenes that he has are doubting Anakin, um, beheading Jango Fett, and, you know, getting killed by Anakin and, and Palpatine, the team-up. So, I mean, like, more justice for Mace Windu. Um, the whole scene, similarly to the Yoda-Dooku battle at the end of Attack of the Clones, it's just plain goofy. I think this scene just amplifies the fallacies of CGI Yoda. It looks really bad. Um, it has not aged well. Um, and I'm not interested in seeing an elderly acrobat versus a CGI leprechaun. None of this really lands for me. So, <laughs> and I totally agree that it's uh, a betrayal of character. It just doesn't seem like something that they would do. Like, Ha, yeah, it's just really bad. I, there's not much more you can say about it. It looks bad. It feels wrong. Um, and I, I feel like the symbolism of the fact that that took place at the Senate and that was the battleground that Palpatine chose and that Yoda was nearly crushed by the seats of the Senate it was once again, as they were wont to do with the symbolism for Palpatine, it was a bit too on the nose for me and it was heavy handed. So uh, it was just a regrettable scene all around. Yeah, I think the easiest way to fix that is just to not have that scene. Uh, just just get that out of there completely. It would have been a much better uh, resolution to that problem. So uh, that uh, wraps up our three big fixes for uh, Revenge of the Sith. Let's go ahead and hit up our lightning round. Chris, quick fix. What you got? Oh, this was almost part of the big three. But this is uh, the relationship between Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala is the worst kept secret marriage ever. 
Let's make out behind a shadowy pillar with the Senate literally 50 feet away. And Anakin wants to do even more. Um, and they're talking awfully loud. And how does no one notice that they live together, that they sleep in the same bed every night? What's that about? So, yeah, this is the worst kept secret in the entire galaxy. Yeah, I think they could have done a lot more with the idea of they're trying to keep this relationship a secret. Uh, that is not a horribly complicated fix, you know, meeting in places that are more out of the way. Um, even maybe top mentioning offhandedly that Anakin keeps an apartment or something somewhere near the Jedi Temple to make it look like he lives there. Something. Uh, yeah, this just came across as a, a, a really low effort. Hey, look, we got a secret marriage, but everybody knows anyways. So yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, Dave, what is first up on your lightning round list? Oh my gosh, please don't call them younglings. Just whatever you do, don't call them younglings. I, Yoda kind of makes it work. Like, when it comes out of Yoda's mouth, since he has that odd speech pattern anyways, it kind of works, almost. But nobody else in this movie can say younglings with a straight face. Nobody. There is not a single reason to make this an official young Jedi term. We already have the term Padawan. That's enough. In the scene where Obi-Wan tells Padme about Anakin killing all these kids... Ewan McGregor literally has to cover his mouth immediately after saying the word youngling. It looks like he's trying to hide a snicker. And every time somebody says the word youngling in this movie, I have to hide a snicker too. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, and there's even the meme that we found while researching for this pod. It sounds like yingling. So either Anakin was killing small children or he was throwing back some brewskis. So, I mean... um. Yeah, it's it's really problematic, and you can easily go with Padawan or Foundling. I think that was what they used in the uh, the Mandalorian. It would be even better. Yeah, I totally agree, Chris. What is your next point? Since when? And we hinted at this before, but since when does the Jedi Council advocate spying? It goes against everything that we were previously told about the Jedi being these space samurai and being upstanding citizens and completely neutral, you know, wise old sages. Uh, it violates everything that I ever believed about the Jedi, that they would advocate um, the Patriot Act-esque br uh, brother eye, eagle eye in the sky. But yeah, um, so that that's really problematic for me. What do you think? Oh, I agree. Once again, the Jedi come across terribly in, in these prequel movies. And it's also really just a half-baked idea. It's just another thing that George Lucas threw in here to have Anakin dislike the Jedi suddenly. Uh, it, and it doesn't work. Uh, I think it goes back again to the motivation of Anakin. Why does he actually fall to the dark side? And, and Lucas seems to be throwing anything in the kitchen sink in there. Oh, well, you know, he's worried about Padme, he's ambitious, he doesn't like the Jedi wanting him to spy on a friend. Let's just throw a whole bunch of different things in there. But but ultimately, it makes the character feel directionless. So I totally agree with that. And I think it, I'm thinking, I think this film came out in 2005, if memory serves. Um, and I know that Lucas previously, uh, even with the original trilogy, likes to make you know, socio-political commentary, so it may have even been something like that for the Bush administration and the Patriot Act and spying and stuff like that. Um, they had, I, I believe the the Empire in the original trilogy were allegories to, like, communist Russia and communist China, but um, it really does not look great, doesn't translate well to the film here. Uh, Dave, what's next up in the lightning round here? Yeah, so I don't want to get too nitpicky, but this is an easy fix. Especially, as we've mentioned before, Lucas had a long time to plan this, and he should have made the, the connections between the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy smoother. So Padme, at the end of this movie, when the twins are born, has a moment with Luke. She holds Luke. Why does she not have this moment with Leia instead? Like what? In Return of the Jedi, Luke actually asks Leia, do you remember our mother? And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I remember some impressions. She was kind, you know, or something. Like, let her have a moment with Leia, not with Luke. George, have you watched your own movies? The wrong twin got that moment with Mama. This would have been an easy bit of continuity between the two trilogies. And he literally put the wrong baby in Padme's hands. What do you think, Chris? 
Yeah, totally. You could even have done this, um, leave it as is, as the film. The The problem here is she says Leia, and then they immediately cut away to another scene. If you would have like given her the same duration of time holding Leia as she did with Luke, I think it would have been fine. And I think this, uh, and I'm going to go super feminist here, I think it's so dismissive towards Leia. Um, and I feel like the more I reflect upon this film... The entire ethos of the movie seems so dismissive of all female characters. Um, and I'm going to go a step further and say the entire film like seems like a huge sausage fest. Like, Luke is the only baby that gets any attention. Padme like goes from being this bad A female in charge in Attack of the Clones. It was one of the strengths of Attack of the Clones, I feel, that um, she freed herself during the gladiator scene. Um, and she took a blaster and she took that whole squadron, even though she was inexplicably not injured after falling out of the gunship, she still was like, come on, let's go. And then she goes, and as soon as she's impregnated, this whole male dominated stereotype that she now has no agency. She can't make any of her own decisions. She's just this weeping woman syndrome, this damsel that she can have no decisions of her own. I think it's really regrettable, the treatment of all the female characters in this film. What few of them there are, let's point exactly. that out. So yes, I totally agree with that. And just, you know, Leia is such a good character and easily a favorite uh, in the original trilogy. And so why in the world would you just give a moment that really should have belonged to Leia in this particular scene to Luke? I, I will never understand. Chris, what is your next big point here? We hinted at this earlier, but General Grievous is such a weird character. Um, I have it in my notes that he looks like he was designed by a six-year-old. Like, who, what grown man thinks up, like, what if we had a robot man with spider legs? It's a spider robot man. He's inexplicably, like, crawling on the walls. Um, I think he's a walking anti-smoking ad. So can somebody get that dude a nicotine patch? That that smoker's cough is serious. He needs to chop the uh, stop the chain <laughs> the chain smoking. It's really problematic. You cannot, and that's probably why he died on Utapal. Um, because you know the the uh, smoking cigarettes that takes a toll on you. You're not as physically fit as you once were. Never mind that you've replaced your human bits with cybernetics. Uh, when you're chain smoking like that, you're not really at your physical best when you're facing a Jedi. So, yeah, General Grievous is such a weird character. I'm going to say what I always say at this point. Should have been Darth Maul. Grievous is a weird character, I agree. And he's definitely supposed to be some kind of callback slash preview of Vader. Mostly mechanical, trouble breathing. It's very much on the nose, uh, really on the nose parallel. But he comes across really oddly. We also know nothing about this guy, so we're not invested in his confrontation with Obi-Wan. We're just told, hey, this dude is important, and that's it. And it comes across as just another reason to separate Obi-Wan and Anakin for a huge chunk of the movie. We, we never get a movie where they're together for the bulk of the movie fighting side by side. Even in this movie, we get a, a, a few minutes at the beginning of the movie, the rest are separated, then they meet again and, and you know try to kill each other. So, uh, should have been Darth Maul. We don't need a, a succession of disposable villains. It, it's just, it doesn't work. Yeah, less is more. Less is more. Less villains is more story, and more meaning. Um, but yeah, Dave, um, we're going medical with your next point. What's next in the lightning round for you? Padme dies of a broken heart. I repeat, Padme Amidala dies of a broken heart, former queen, senator, a woman who has picked up arms countless times, who has proven her strength and bravery in the face of adversity, dies of a broken heart, loses the will to live. I don't buy it. Anakin can kill a bunch of kids in this movie, but George Lucas draws the line in him doing something that accidentally kills Padme. Why not have Padme actively trying to interfere in the fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin and heroically dying in the crossfire trying to stop her husband? Why does she have to stand there and literally say, Anakin, you're breaking my heart. And then the next thing you know, some medical droid is like she's losing the will to live. That is just so... 
dismissive of the character and and and, and medically just kind of silly. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, so I had, I, I googled this. Um, I'm I'm a nerd, so. According to an ABC News article, I'm quoting here, while the stress of grief may bring on general health impacts, there is a legitimate and specific medical condition called toxubo cardiomyopathy or heartbreak syndrome that doctors say is dying of a broken heart, but it's incredibly rare. However, I find it incredibly hard to believe that it would be instantaneous. The people and the cases that I've seen where this is even suggested, it's over a significant amount of time. It is not like my cat died or my husband left me and I dropped dead. You know, it is not instantaneous like this. Um, What about the two children that she just brought into the world? Um, Not the fact that, not to mention the fact that he just strangled her. Um, That could have been a cause of death. Um, I, I like your you know, adjustment to where that she's like gets caught in the crossfire that works, but, and as you hinted of, it's again, indicative of the male dominated story that the female is just a throwaway plot device. And because her husband is assumingly perished or has gone to the dark side, she has no longer the will to live because she was depending on that man to give her a reason to live. And it's just really regrettable. You know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go a step further. I do not understand how George Lucas can write a scene where Padme is giving birth and literally forget about the kids. Like, a parent would not just lay down their life and, and wallow in their, and die literally from their own sadness if they have two children to take care of. I'll, I'll take this another step further and circle back around to the whole... Uh, Anakin killing younglings thing. The guy just found out a little while ago that he's going to be a father and he's trying to save his wife and children. I find it difficult to believe that his reaction to that revelation is, I'm going to go kill some kids. And that he would not, wouldn't even hesitate and think, what if somebody did this to my children? It is, it is such a, a mischaracterization of the situation, I think. Chris, what is your next point? Uh, we hinted at this before, and I'll be very brief. Enough with the flipping. Enough with the acrobatics. It's so ridiculous and unbelievable. It's pretty sad that the original trilogy, which came 20 years to 30 years previously, has significantly better lightsaber duels. The Anakin and Obi-Wan is okay, but they're still inexplicable flipping for no reason. They are on level ground. Let me do an inexplicable front flip, back flip, for no reason whatsoever. Just... It doesn't even look good. It hasn't aged well, CGI-wise, stunt-wise, whatever. Um, I, I, I hate the flipping. Please, no more flipping. When it comes to lightsaber duels like this, I really believe that the best lightsaber duel we got in the prequel was the one with Darth Maul. And there the flipping made sense because it was primarily Maul doing it. It was very much Darth Maul's fighting style, whereas Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were much more grounded in their approach. And when you look at the actual original trilogy, the best lightsaber fight by far was Empire Strikes Back, which again featured very little flipping of any kind. It's very grounded in a lot of ways, and it's still very exciting. I think the ultimate problem for these lightsaber duels is that they were over-choreographed, and it comes across as very fake in the end. I will even take, and I love um, Obi-Wan in the original trilogy, Sir Alec Guinness is wonderful. I'll even take his duel with Vader in A New Hope, which is literally just touching lightsabers um, and then, whoops, I disappear. I will take that over this ridiculous flipping. I'll take that any day of the week. Dave, what's next up in your lightning round? It's, it's another very simple way to properly connect the prequel trilogy with the original trilogy. George Lucas made the decision to have R2-D2 and C-3PO there. And he knew he was going to have to deal with that. And then we reach the end of the movie, and an order is given to wipe C-3PO's memory, but not R2-D2's. And that is nonsense. Why would R2-D2 never tell Luke what he knew about Anakin and Obi-Wan? He could have done so in two ways very easily. Number one, he could have asked C-3PO to translate. 
Or number two, whenever he is plugged into Luke's X-Wing, he literally can make words appear on his screen. They literally can have a conversation. We see that in Empire Strikes Back. And yet, R2 never says a word. What kind of horrible person, quote-unquote, is this droid to never open his mouth and tell Luke anything? And you could have fixed this very easily by just simply having both droids' minds wiped. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And I've said this a thousand times. I've said it at least three or four times on each episode uh, in this series. They shouldn't be in this trilogy. It's ridiculous. Okay, we get the fan service. We know that you made the original trilogy, George. We know that you made Star Wars before. But, you know, if, you, if you're if you just insistent, like you love them so much as characters, they have to be. Maybe they're cameos. Maybe they're here or maybe they're in a cut scene. But it's just highly problematic. And I go back to this. I've said it before. I'll say it again. How does Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, not recognize a droid of his own creation in C-3PO and R2-D2, which his, was his inseparable friend and droid throughout this entire period in galactic history? How in the world does, does, does Darth Vader go through a mind wipe as well? Because that's the only thing that makes this make sense. Yeah, it, you're exactly right. It makes no sense. Chris, what is your next point for our lightning round? Um, is the Galactic Republic run by some crazy religious organization? Padme says after she discovers or she reveals that she is pregnant that she'll have to be she'll she'll be forced to leave the Senate and that she'll have to retire. Like, why is that? It's never explained. It's just a throwaway line, and it's supposed to. I guess add to the secrecy of their marriage and their relationship, but um, it's just a weird thing. I don't really have much to comment on it, but like, why is it so bad that she's pregnant? It seems to be once again just a really weirdly disrespectful thing towards women. Oh, oh, she's pregnant. Well, now she can't do her job anymore, ever again apparently because she has to leave the Senate. Yeah, so it's it's that's a very odd comment. I totally agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Dave, what is next up on the lightning round for you? You know, this movie is a lot better in a lot of ways than the previous two prequels, but there's one thing that still holds true. The dialogue is total cringe. I didn't want this a main, make this one of my main points, but it still holds true. Padme famously says in this movie, hold me like you <laughs> did by the lake on Naboo so long ago <laughs> where there was nothing but our love. No politics, no plotting, no war. She must have a memory wipe herself, because at that time she was on Naboo. Why? Because she was literally hiding from a politically motivated assassination. I think there was politics and plotting, and there was an upcoming war. So I do not know where that particular line came from. Also, at that point, um, by the lake, she was still kind of creeped out by Anakin. So that seems to be some revisionist history right there. Any scene with Anakin and Padme really falls flat because of the cringy dialogue. Here, here's also Padme. You are breaking my heart. Why does she have to say that so directly, George? Show, don't tell. It's like one of the most basic rules of writing. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, and for someone who has gone on to, I think, win an Academy Award, at least be nominated for one, it's an absolute disservice to someone who is so talented in their craft. Like, my favorite Natalie Portman performance comes in V for Vendetta. It's just absolutely mind-blowing, her performance, when she's given, you know, adequate dialogue. And, I, you know, I guess this is going to be the recurring theme. But, like, she's the one that is given the worst dialogue by far in this film. Like, it's not even close. Um, there are some goofy one-liners for other characters, but she gets she gets the worst of it bar none you, you you stole my thunder because the only note i had on this was hold me like you did by the lake on naboo so please you don't have to hold me dave i'm good <laughs> i tell you it's 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 a, such a memorable line and in absolutely the the worst way possible uh so chris what is your final point for our lightning round here oh boy um i hinted at this in attack of the clones when their grand scheme to hide was to go to her ha home planet on naboo um, and they literally say where they're deciding what to do with these twins after their mother lost the will to live because she didn't care about them, apparently. Um, hide them where the Sith will never find him. 
where would that be? Hmm, maybe Anakin's home planet of Tatooine. That is sheer genius. Of all the places in the galaxy far, far away, we should hide this child with the Skywalker's family, albeit by marriage, on his home planet of Tatooine. Darth Vader will never think to look for those children there. Well, we know that Anakin hates sand, so he's never going to go back to Tatooine. I mean, clearly, it's too rough and coarse, and it probably gets into all his gears and his artificial limbs at this point, so he's just not ever going to go back to Tatooine. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. This really brings to light the problem of, of, of Anakin having to be from Tatooine. Like, why? Why did we do that in episode one? We could have avoided this problem just by having Anakin from a different planet. It makes the galaxy seem so small. Everything keeps coming back to Tatooine in the in these six movies. Tatooine, 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 over and over again. Let's just have Anakin be from somewhere else. And then, yeah, sure, okay, you, you hide uh, Luke on Tatooine. It's this backwater planet nobody's ever heard of. Makes sense. But just because Anakin was from Tatooine, it makes this really awkward situation. Yeah, it's, it's really odd. And it was even one of the few criticisms I had with The Mandalorian, that episode where they went to Tatooine. I was like, really? This? Again? There are so many more planets, you know, that, that we could be dealing with. But once again, Tatooine. It's fun to say, I admit. But no, we can, we can avoid Tatooine. Uh, Dave... At least you're ending the lightning round on a high note, so to speak. Pun fully intended. What you got? Oh, I totally have the high ground in this situation. Uh, the high ground moment, the, the, the climactic moment of the battle between Anakin and Obi-Wan is really quite silly. I mean, it's supposed to be this grand climax, but it comes across as just this incredibly silly moment. Obi-Wan is standing on top of this area, and he's like, I've got the high ground. And Anakin is all like, haha, I can get you anyways. And Obi-Wan's like, don't do it. And then he just, in one swift motion, cuts like his arm and two legs off and lets him lay there. It's silly, but it, it also really paints Obi-Wan in a very poor light. He leaves Anakin there to die after watching him literally catch fire. But hey, to make the connection with the original trilogy, he callously makes sure to pick up his lightsaber first before he leaves. Like, that is such a weird moment between two people who were supposed to be like brothers, as Obi-Wan says. So, why not try to take Anakin with you? Try to redeem him. He, he's like your brother. Don't just let him lay there and watch him catch fire by the lava. That is make, it makes Obi-Wan look really bad. It would have been a much better scene. Hey, we're here to fix this thing. If Anakin and Obi-Wan were fighting, and Obi-Wan disarmed Anakin, and Anakin fell, and Obi-Wan is even trying to catch him because he's still wanting to redeem his friend, but he falls into a batch of lava. And Obi-Wan stands there and he's weeping, holding Anakin's weapon because he disarmed him. But he thinks he's dead and so he leaves. And then we cut and we see that Anakin actually only partially fell in and he pulled himself out and he's still alive. And then Obi-Wan comes across still heroically, rather than this guy who literally watches his quote-unquote brother burn in front of him and then just walks away. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. It's also a really silly, once again, heavy-handed metaphor. Obi-Wan being the more upstanding moral character, having the high ground. It's pretty goofy. Um, and I feel like even strategically... Why in the world would Anakin not just leap onto the shore, run up the hill, and do something? Why would, again, with the flipping, if you were to solve this with no more flipping, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> if he just charges up the hill, does a force push, and pushes him back, then that, you know, negates the high ground. It was just a really, for the most part, a, a pretty good, you know, lightsaber duel. One of one of the strongest ones of this prequel trilogy. To end on such in, in such ridiculous fashion, and as you said, he watches his brother catch fire and just slowly walks away. And um, you're not going to be using this lightsaber anytime soon. So, so I'll take this snatch. Yeah, it's 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 a very poor climax to a, a decent lightsaber duel. Ultimately, well, here we are, Chris. We have fixed the prequel trilogy, all three, our grand finale. How does it feel? Um, it feels pretty good. I feel like you and I. Um, really missed out on a career in Hollywood. Um, I feel like 
Lucasfilm should give us a call, send us a DM, send us an email, something. Um, I, I feel really strong about what we were able to achieve here. What do you think? I, I agree. I actually like some of the changes we've made, and ultimately I think it would have uh, led to a better prequel trilogy. When we come back from a short break, we have our nerd commendations for the week. Stick around. And we're back, ladies and gentle people, for the Nerd Commendation segment of the Nerd by Word podcast. Chris, what are you recommending to nerds around the world this week? I'm going with one of my um, favorite recent runs um, on a comic, uh, and I'm going with Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, Volume 2, that is written by Tom Taylor. Um, You may know him from his work on Deceased. Uh, for DC, he also did um, X Men Red um, recently, a couple of years ago. Uh, features art primarily by Juan Cabal, but it also has Yildare Sinar, Ken Lashley, Scott Hanna, Luca Maresca, Todd Nock, Iguara, DK Ruan, and Marguerite Sauvage. Um, what I really just love about this, and this is a really short run, it's only 14 issues. Um, it's all available on Marvel Unlimited. So you can you can binge the whole thing in, in maybe even a day um, if you're if you're if you read like I do you could probably read that in an entire day just fourteen issues. What I really love about it is Tom Taylor truly understands the character of Peter Parker. Um, he understands his ethos. He understands his inspirations as a character. Why he does what he does. Why he wears the mask of Spider Man. Um, it returns, it's, it's a B book as, as we say in, you know, in comics, it's a, it's a B book. It's not the main line. It doesn't screw with any continuity, uh, things that are happening in amazing Spider-Man. Um, I, I love the return to street level stuff, the supporting cast, those relationships that Peter has with the people in his life. It also plays the hits. So if you're one for nostalgia and you love, um, the main relationships, uh, in Peter's life, um, spoiler: If you're not reading current comics, Peter is dating MJ once again. So we'll see where that leads. But it has a real beautiful couple of issues. Um, there's even one where it is primarily focused on Mary Jane herself, um, and she like has to play the the rescue of Citizen Hero and stuff like that. Um, and then it it focuses um, on another issue on on. Just the ins and outs of being in a relationship with a superhero. Um, and it's really just an interesting dynamic. Um, and I really felt like it resonated with, with someone who's been in a committed relationship for a long time. Um, I felt a lot of like callbacks to the relationship that I have with my wife. Um, there's a really great scene um, where Peter is ordering bagels in a bagel shop. If you've ever been in New York, you know what it's like to order bagels. You know how you know integral that is. Um, and he knows exactly what to order for Mary Jane. And then he takes like 10 minutes and everybody is yelling at him because he doesn't know what he wants. He goes to the same bagel shop, you know, so I could relate to that. Um, it also has great cameos and, you know, single issue relationships and, and stories with um, Aunt May. There's an interesting story arc there. Um uh, Human Torch, one of my favorite friendships in comics is is Peter Parker and Johnny Storm. Really great. There's some great issues in this run with that. Um, the Prowler, which is one of my favorite characters um, in the Spider-Man um, community as well. Um, there's a really beautiful emotional issue in number six with um, Spider-Bite, a new hero that's introduced. Um, a real emotional gut punch, and I'm not going to you know, spoil anything there, but check out issue number six for sure. If you read one issue from this run, it's definitely issue number six, but yeah, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man volume two, um, volume one came back in the early two thousands, I think was done by Peter David, but this is volume two by Tom Taylor, uh, and company. And it just really, as a Spider-Man fan, um, with, with comics going the way they are being mainstreamed and being plugged into events. I, uh, uh, Nick Spencer's amazing run currently has been hit or miss for me. Um, some real high points, but some some kind of you know duds. But I think this really truly captured what what 
you love about Spider-Man. So I, I highly recommend this one. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to picking this up now because I didn't realize this was uh, written by Tom Taylor. Uh, he's quite a talent. I've really enjoyed his uh, Injustice comic books at DC based on the video games. Uh, there are moments in there that are so uh, perfect in, in capturing the characters that, that he's dealing with there, uh, even though he's basically writing in an alternate universe. Uh, I'm a big fan of those books, and so I'm definitely going to want to pick this up. Uh, he also did quite a bit of Star Wars work. Uh, I've enjoyed going back to the Dark Horse era uh, before the license returned to Marvel. So uh, I'm sold on this just because Tom Taylor's name's attached to it, and I'm looking forward to checking it out. I also saw, like, I follow him on social media and whatnot, and um, when the news story broke out that Warner didn't know what to do with Superman, that's a whole nother podcast in and of itself. We touched on it briefly, but we could do an entire episode on that. But he had a very simple, like, paragraph-length tweet about exactly how you would make a Superman film. And I think I sent it to you. I'm like, he gets it. He gets Superman. So, like, that's what I love about a writer who truly understands the character that they're writing or characters that they're writing about. And they go with that and they lean into that. And when you have a writer that truly understands the character. For me, I had this with JMS, um, J.M. J. Mateus, um, of course, Stan Lee. Jerry Conway, people that understand who Peter Parker is, it just really sings. And it's like you look down, and, and Bendis on Ultimate especially, um, when you look down and you've read 20 issues and you don't even know, like, when did that happen? Because you have such a beautiful story by someone who truly understands that character. Dave, what do you have for us this week for your nerd, uh, nerd commendation? Yeah, I'm going to stay away from comic books this time, at least uh Still, still kind of tangentially connected, but I'm going to talk about a Netflix uh, series. I wanted to talk a little bit about Warrior Nun, which is just like one of the greatest titles of a, of a TV show ever, if you ask me. <laughs> so Warrior Nun is a Netflix television series created by Simon Barry and is based on a comic book uh, character from the book Warrior Nun Ariela. Uh, by Ben Dunn. It doesn't really follow the comic book story too closely, and it just kind of lifts the concept and kind of goes off in its own direction. The series is led by a, a Portuguese actress. This is her first English language work, I believe, Alba Baptista. And she plays Ava Silver, the main character. Uh, and she's an orphan who uh, discovers she has powers after a artifact is implanted into her back. And she has to join an ancient order of warrior nuns. This show definitely has um, some Buffy the Vampire Slayer vibes going on. Um, although it's not that good. I mean, it's good, don't get me wrong. It was very enjoyable, but it's not its not quite Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which holds a very uh, special place in my heart. But Alba Baptista is a revelation in this role. I know where she's been in, in Portugal, but like she needs to get a lot more work, uh, English language work too, uh, because she's fantastic, easily the best thing in this show. Her acting has great range. She has these really deep and dark moments, but she also has these incredibly funny and goofy moments. She can literally do it all in this show and was just mesmerizing to watch every time that she was on screen. A big shout out also to uh, Toya Turner as Shotgun Mary and Christina uh, Young as Sister Beatrice, both fantastic in their roles as well. Uh, the acting in this show was just really good. Um, now, it's not without its flaws, I'll admit that. Uh, the first half of the season suffers from a common Netflix affliction of moving way too slowly. Uh, the first six episodes or so moved very leisurely. Uh, Ava spends a lot of time running away from the actual story, so to speak. And it becomes a little tedious after a while. There she goes again. She's still trying to get away. She's still trying to get away. Can we please just get her onto the A storyline instead of her always trying to run away? Uh, the other problem is that the show has not been renewed for a second season yet. And still the writers decided to leave everything on this massive cliffhanger. Not a single plot thread is resolved. Uh, the finale raises more questions than it answers. Um, and Netflix doesn't have a great track record of consistently renewing shows, even if they're doing fairly well. Uh, I'm looking at you, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, uh, recently canceled despite being an incredibly popular show. Even though the reviews and the viewing numbers appear to be positive, there's really no guarantee the show will get a chance to continue. So I would have been more pleased with the show if they would have 
finished a story arc and then had something else to fall back on for the second season rather than leaving everything hanging in the air. Overall, though, I really liked the show. Solid acting, decent special effects, truly interesting story kept me watching even through some of the slower parts. I'm very pleased having watched it. Yeah, I can say that um, when when you put this on the list, I recognized it immediately because my wife, who's a huge fantasy, um, you know, type of fan, she binged it in like a day or two. Um, so you know, that was a that was a pretty you know good recommendation. If if she watches something like that, you know, then then I know it's pretty good. I thought it was a really interesting premise, and I'll, I'll definitely have to check that one out. Um, I can totally you know, concur when it comes to the Netflix syndrome, as you said, I'm looking at you, Daredevil, um, moving really slowly, just, just get me to bullseye and get me to the Kingpin, their altercation. I, I don't need all of this other stuff. I, I know who these characters are, but, um, I thought the Witcher, uh, was another one that, that moved pretty slowly, not to mention the, the timeline was, was really jarring at first, um, until I kind of just figured it out on my own. But, um, yeah, I'll definitely have to check this one out. Thanks for the recommendation. All righty, ladies and gentle people, this is it for us this week. Another episode of the Nerd Byword on the Books. Remember, if you want to know more about what we're up to, uh, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Nerd by Word and on Facebook at The Nerd by Word. We are very interested in hearing from you, so please send us a message. You can also send us an email at um, nerdbyword at gmail.com uh, we're more than glad to answer any questions you have or even maybe listen to some suggestions you have for us yeah absolutely and we are available wherever you get your podcast from if that's Apple Podcasts um, if that is Spotify the TuneIn app or you can even do it directly from our web ser- uh, website nerdbyword.com now if you are on Apple Podcasts or something like that where you can subscribe and leave us a review please do so give us those five stars we love stars. Give us those five stars and, and let us know what you think of the show. Uh, we've got a couple of reviews on there already, a couple of uh, comments, and, and it's just really instrumental and to help us build this show as we move forward. Um, I will uh, say that we have some really great content lining up for you over the next couple of weeks. Um, we've got some truly special guests coming in for interviews. Uh, I think you guys are really going to thoroughly enjoy uh, what we've got coming up for you. Um, as always, thanks for joining us and stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd By Word is produced by two nerds, Chris and Dave, to encompass all aspects of the nerd multiverse. The theme music was written by Al Jimenez. Our show art features original art by Ashby Design as well as public domain comic pens. Find us online at nerdbyword.com, on Twitter at nerdbyword, and send questions and comments to nerdbyword at gmail.com.